Chapter Four of Havoc by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter Four: The Night Train from Vienna. Dorward, whistling softly to himself, sat in a corner of his coupe, rolling innumerable cigarettes. He was a man of unbounded courage and wonderful resource, but with a slightly exaggerated idea as to the sanctity of an American citizen. He had served his apprenticeship in his own country, and his name had become a household word owing to his brilliant success as war correspondent in the Russo-Japanese War. His experience of European countries, however, was limited. After the more obvious dangers with which he had grappled, and which he had overcome during his adventurous career, he was disposed to be a little contemptuous of the subtler perils at which his friend Bellamy had plainly hinted. He had made his escape from the hotel without any serious difficulty, and since that time, although he had taken no particular precautions, he had remained unmolested. From his own point of view, therefore, it was perhaps only reasonable that he should no longer have any misgiving as to his personal safety. Arrest as a thief was the worst which he had feared. Even that he seemed now to have evaded. The coupé was exceedingly comfortable, and, after all, he had had a somewhat exciting day. He lit a cigarette and stretched himself out with a murmur of immense satisfaction. He was close upon the great triumph of his life. He was perfectly content to lie there and look out upon the flying landscape upon which the shadows were now fast descending. He was safe, absolutely safe, he assured himself. Nevertheless, when the door of his coupé was opened, he started almost like a guilty man. The relief in his face as he recognized his visitor was obvious. It was Bellamy who entered and dropped into a seat by his side. "'Wasting your time, aren't you?' the latter remarked, pointing to a growing heap of cigarettes. "'Well, I guess not,' Dorward answered. "'I can smoke this lot before we reach London.' Bellamy smiled enigmatically. "'I don't think that you will,' he said. "'Why not?' "'You are such a sanguine person,' Bellamy sighed. "'Personally, I do not think that there is the slightest chance of your reaching London at all.' Dorward laughed scornfully. "'And why not?' he asked. Bellamy merely shrugged his shoulders. Dorward seemed to find the gesture irritating. "'You've got espionage on the brain, my dear friend,' he declared dryly. "'I suppose it's the result of your profession. I may not know so much about Europe as you do, but I am inclined to think that an American citizen traveling with his passport on a train like this is moderately safe.' especially when he's not above a scrap by way of taking care of himself. "'You're a plucky fellow,' remarked Bellamy. "'I don't see any pluck about it. In Vienna, I must admit, I shouldn't have been surprised if they'd tried to fake up some sort of charge against me, but anyhow they didn't. Guess they'd find it a pretty tall order trying to interfere with an American citizen.' Bellamy looked at his friend curiously. "'I suppose you're not bluffing by any chance, Dorward,' he said. "'You really believe what you say? "'Why in thunder shouldn't I?' Dorward asked. Bellamy sighed. "'My dear Dorward,' he said, "'it is amazing to me that a man of your experience "'should talk and behave like a baby. "'You've taken some notice of your fellow passengers, I suppose.' "'I've seen a few of them,' Dorward answered carelessly. "'What about them?' "'Nothing much,' Bellamy declared, "'except that there are, to my certain knowledge, three high officials of the secret police of Austria, in the next coupé but one, and at least four or five of their subordinates, somewhere on board the train. Dorward withdrew his cigarette from his mouth and looked at his friend keenly. "'I guess you're trying to scare me, Bellamy,' he remarked. But Bellamy was suddenly grave. There had come into his face an utterly altered expression. His tone when he spoke was almost solemn. "'Dorward,' he said, Upon my honor, I assure you that what I have told you is the truth. I cannot seem to make you realize the seriousness of your position. When you left the palace with that paper in your pocket, you were, to all intents and purposes, a doomed man. 
your passport and your american citizenship count for absolutely nothing i have come in to warn you that if you have any last messages to leave you had better give them to me now this is a pretty good bluff you're putting up dorward exclaimed contemptuously the long and short of it is i suppose that you want me to break the seal of this document and let you read it bellamy shook his head it is too late for that dorward he said if the seal were broken they'd very soon guess where i came in and it would help the work i have in hand for me to be picked up with a bullet in my forehead on the railway track dorward frowned uneasily what are you here for anyway then he asked well frankly not to argue with you bellamy answered as a matter of fact you are of no use to me any longer i am sorry old man you can't say that i didn't give you good advice i am bound to play for my own hand though in this matter and if i get any benefit at all out of my journey it will be after some regrettable accident has happened to you say ring the bell for drinks and chuck this dorward exclaimed i've had about enough of it i am not denying anything you say but if these fellows really are on board they'll think twice before they meddle with me on the contrary bellamy assured him they will not take the trouble to think at all their minds are perfectly made up as to what they are going to do however that's finished i have nothing more to say dorward gazed for a minute or two fixedly out of the window look here bellamy he said turning abruptly round supposing i change my mind supposing i open this precious document and let you read it over with me bellamy rose hastily to his feet you must not think of it he exclaimed you would simply write my death warrant don't allude to that matter again i have risked enough coming in here to sit with you then for heaven's sake don't stop any longer dorward said irritably you get on my nerves with all this foolish talk in an hour's time i am going to bolt my door and go to sleep we'll breakfast together in the morning if you like bellamy said nothing the steward had brought them the whiskies and sodas which dorward had ordered bellamy raised his tumbler to his lips and set it down again forgive me he said i do not think that i am thirsty dorward drank his off at a gulp almost immediately he closed his eyes bellamy with a little shrug of the shoulders left him alone as he passed along to his own coupe he met louise in the corridor you have seen von burling he whispered she nodded he is in that coupe number seven alone she said i invited him to come in with me but he seemed embarrassed it is his companions who watch him all the time he has promised to talk with me later in the middle of the night louise opened her eyes to find bellamy bending over her louise he whispered it is von burling who will take possession of the packet they have been discussing whether it will not be safer to go on to london instead of doubling back see von burling again do all you can to persuade him to come to london all you can louise remember so she whispered i shall put on my dressing-gown and sit in the corridor it is hot here bellamy glided out closing the door softly behind him the train was rushing on now through the blackness of an unusually dark night for some time he sat in his own compartment listening the voices whose muttered conversation he had overheard were silent now but once he fancied that he heard shuffling footsteps and a little cry in his heart he knew well that before morning dorward would have disappeared the man within him was hard to subdue he longed to make his way to dorward's side to interfere in this terribly unequal struggle yet he made no movement dorward was a man and a friend but what was a life more or less it was to a greater cause that he was pledged towards three o'clock he lay down on his bed and slept the train attendant brought him his coffee soon after daylight the man's hands were trembling where are we bellamy asked sleepily near munich monsieur the man answered monsieur noticed perhaps that we stopped for some time in the night bellamy shook his head i sleep soundly he said i heard nothing there has been an accident the man declared an american gentleman who got in at vienna was drinking whiskey all night and became very drunk in a tunnel he threw himself out upon the line 
Bellamy shuddered a little. He had been prepared, but nonetheless it was an awful thing, this. "'You are sure that he is dead?' he asked. The man was very sure indeed. "'There was a doctor from Vienna upon the train, sir,' he said. He examined him at once, but death must have been instantaneous. Bellamy drew a long breath and commenced to put on his clothes. The next move was for him. End of chapter 4 Recording by Tom Weiss TomsAudiobooks.com